And I'll over to Katie. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeff. And thanks, everybody, for attending today on this, this sort of sunny Monday afternoon. Uh, like Jeff said, I'm Katie Bridges. I'm the instructional designer here at Georgia Highland College. And um, a little background about the presentation you're going to see is one of a series of six on designing accessible documents. This is our introduction section session. This is on the, all of the like properties for documents, Excel files, PowerPoint presentations that can ultimately end up in accessible PDFs. I'm going to talk um, about several things today. First, I'm going to talk about our agenda. We're going to define accessibility. And we're going to talk about the law, specifically about Section 08, which focuses on accessibility and its parts and pieces. I'm going to go over some of the frequently asked questions that I get regarding um, accessible documents. And then we're going to talk about those common factors that make Word, Excel, and PowerPoint files accessible. So, just to start, I'm going to go ahead and start with this definition of accessibility. For a quick demonstration, I would love of everyone to go ahead and sit back and close your eyes for the next 45 seconds. I want you to listen to the video that I'm going to play. Think about what you're hearing, and at the end, I'm going to ask you guys what you think the video is about. No peeking. So everyone will close your eyes and just listen. of what you thought the uh, the video was about. Oh, I'm getting some guesses. Uh, <laughs> uh, everyone's sending them to me. If change your send to to um, I think you all have all participants privilege, but if you do all panelists or hosts and panelists, that will work a little better. But so far we have whales, uh, ocean or outer space, watching a video, space travel, mm -hmm. and strategies, Thank and you. One, another whales. Okay. <laughs> Science. <laughs> and I'm glad to see that Tom Harden has not seen life. <laughs> he um, uh, he knows about, um, but he has seen this video before. Um, all right, so I want everyone to keep their eyes open this time, and let's watch the video again. a little bit quieter than what most people had heard. But not not our space or ocean life or sea life, something really different. Now, what you guys have just experienced in the little exercise 
is students with disabilities experience when they try to access content that's not fully accessible. It's like trying to watch a video with your eyes closed. So that is this important. This um, important a lot of levels, but we want to make sure that our students are always able to access all the content that we make available to them in our courses, whether face to face or online. Talk about what accessibility really is. I am the age of when I have a new word and I want to know what it means, I go to the dictionary. I don't Google it, I actually go to a physical dictionary. In case I went to Miriam Webster and I love how in the first uh, defines the word with the word. It's really kind of annoying and doesn't tell us anything. But these four definitions that Miriam Webster has provided us, I think the fourth one by her is the most relevant to what we're talking about today. Capable of being used and being seen. We have content that works so hard to put together for our students, for them to use it and for them to be able to see it. In night, Leo Valdez works an accessibility company was commissioned by the United Nations project called Enable. And during the course of that project, he actually defined accessibility with this definition, this means of providing flexibility to accommodate each user's needs and preferences. Um, more than the fourth definition of Merriam-Webster, I find this definition to be the best definition of the word accessibility. I think it covers um, all all users, whether it be the public or whether it be our students or our coworkers, it also um, includes the word flexibility because every person needs a different. And we need to be able to not have a prescriptive type of way to address accessibility, but more of a flexible one. So when we talk about the need for accessibility, um, it, it's always linked to disability. The United Nations. Says that about 15% of the population is disabled. Um, in a recent study by the CDC, it said that 22% of the United States was also considered disabled. But what I think is most interesting is this notation that if you have a life expectancy of over 70 years, um, a person has been on average eight years of their life as a disability. Now, it doesn't say that will happen at the end of their life. That they will have an average over their lifespan of disability. We're going to talk about more of what those potentially can be here in a moment. Um, so these categories of disability, most we think about on a pretty regular basis: uh, the intellectual ones, the deaf and hard of hearing, um, cognitive, um, vision ones. We we think of blindness and low vision, but very do we think about colorblind blindness? I'm married to a colorblind man. So, um, uh, colorblindness is something that's on the forefront in our household. What I want to draw to most is the very last one, temporary permanent disabilities. Since now that a person will spend on average eight years of their life with some form of a disability, because it could be temporary. If you've ever broken a leg or had carpal tunnel surgery, um, being pregnant in some ways can be very disabling, especially if you experience something like uh, high blood pressure where you can't get up and move around a lot. Um, with these things in mind, especially temporary disabilities when we're dealing with our students, because we know when someone's going to um, explore one of those temporary disabilities during their course work. Talk about the law on this part. It was 98. The Act of 1973 was amended to include Section 508, which has a specific focus on the accessibility of electronic and information technology. Now, there are basic parts to this law. The first part states, and I'm going to do what's in blue here, that electronic and information technology allows federal employees with abilities to have access to all this information. Mind. The first part is with the federal employees being able to access the information at their location. Of the law is the public that is the information or services from a federal agency needs to be able to have access to it. The year, the IRS's website, 
is on a frequent basis. So the IRS website needs to be accessible to all individuals. Now you notice that it doesn't say in here anything about state run agencies. Uh, doesn't say anything about anyone who receives federal financial aid for their students. So we fit in this mix. Why do we have to comply with Section 508? Well, we apply because we receive funds for the Technology Related Assistance for Individuals Act, Individuals with Disabilities Act. It also in 1998 and requires us to comply. All 50 states plus the Federal District of Columbia and four territories receive funding for assistive technology, things like screen readers. In we receive funds for what we call Tools for Life. Which we all are aware of, is a Mac that's hosted at Georgia Tech. It's been around since 1991. So, even though we are not a federal entity to uh, get information out to the public, or federal employees trying to access information, this is the reason that we need to make sure we comply with this particular line. So, here are pieces of relevant civil rights legislation that often get confused in this mix of accessibility. Second, the Rehabilitation Act focuses on that individuals with disabilities can't be excluded from participation. They can't be denied anything. Uh, they can't be discriminated for any sort of activity, which is different from Section 508, which is making sure that the content is accessible. Then we have the Disabilities Act of 1990, which says that we can't discriminate for any particular reason for someone having a disability. In 2008, it was extended so that the rights of those people with disabilities are protected under the law. So we have four different pieces to this puzzle, but today, as I said, we're only talking about Section 508. So it's divided up into many parts and pieces. One of the parts has to deal with software applications and operating systems. So the systems that we use at our institutions must be compliant with this requirement. So Windows, uh, Microsoft Office, um, um, Mac operating systems. So any of those tools that we're using or we're our students to use must be compliant much anything we put on the internet. Enter and intranet. So don't forget about those things that are inside your firewall. They might post on your faculty web pages or on your center web pages or departmental web pages. All content too need to be accessible. Select the products like phones. Have you noticed or wondered why there's a bump on the number five? Well, not a cell phone, but a, a regular handheld telephone. The bumper for the people to realize that it's on the five and to go the of it are one, two, and three. So the left, right, four, and six, and below are seven, eight, and nine. Audio event is the same thing. Back when we had VCRs, there were bumps on the buttons. I know I'm probably dating myself. But there are bumps to kind of tell us, or maybe a shape of a triangle or the fast forward button. Those are all there to help make these products accessible. Contain items like calculators and fax means and printers. Again, the bumps on the buttons are what have helped to make these products accessible to users who um, have more low vision or are blind in this particular instance. Calculators are tricky, especially. Um, the green calculators, um, so I, I'm not exactly sure how they keep the graphing calculators fully accessible, but I haven't been looking into it and I haven't found anything definitive yet. Of course, have desktop and portable computers. This is why they have speakers built in and microphones and can adjust the volume by using a button a lot of times on your keyboard. Or um, you have the function keys on your keyboard where you can do different things like refresh your screen, open an item, or spell check. All those are there to help make these, make these products and these uh, applications accessible to users with disabilities. 
assessment of Section 508 comes from two different entities. It comes from the Department of Education, and it also comes from the Department of Justice. Uh, the Department of Education uh, is the investigation, investigative side, and the Department of Justice is actually the group that does the legal side of this particular application. Now, there's been a lot of talk in the news recently about Berkeley having to remove 20,000, well, Berkeley choosing to remove 20,000 videos from a website because they weren't closed captioned. Were they the only ones that have these lawsuits and complaints? Here's a list. Now, I don't use this list to scare you or alarm you or even talk about this information to incite fear. It's more about information. So if we look specifically at the University of Kentucky, they received um, a lawsuit because their sport at their football stadium was not closed captioned. Now you would think, well, why wouldn't it be closed captioned? Well, an uh, individual had requested that it be closed captioned, and the institution denied the request. Well, and again, and this time they were sued. The story is that when the situation was brought to the attention of the University of Kentucky, they denied the request. They are working with students who have disabilities and they run across content that maybe isn't accessible. What we need to remember is, is that we're going to work to make that content accessible to the students. This is how we stay off of this list. It's not that we're going to tell a student, mm, I'm not going to do it. You don't need access to that. Just too bad. We're going to say anything like that to our students. That's why this information is important and informative. It's not meant to scare or make you nervous. But it's, there's all different institutions on here. There's a for profit, not for profit, IB, and technical college systems. There's community colleges. And there's um, schools from the East Coast to the West Coast. So just remember that when we get asked, we just need to make sure that we comply. Ask questions. When I adventure with accessibility, I work with, I'm only instructional designer to 300 faculty here at Georgia Highlands. And so I get these questions asked to me more often than anything. Other questions about fonts. I'm kind of a font weirdo. And I love to use different types of fonts because I, I'm a designer. I like to make things look pretty. So the font we want to try to use in our documents and in our presentation and ultimately our PDF are serif fonts or the sans serif fonts. The font just means it has a foot. So maybe something like Times New Roman or Furry or New. Those are serif fonts. Now the sans serif fonts are things like Arial and Helvetica and uh, Cajon, Common Sans. Those are all the ones that don't have a foot. Now, this list is a short list. There are many others that meet this criteria, but these are probably the most popular ones. Like Georgia and Trebuchet were actually developed specifically for use on the internet. So when you are designing content to go online, you need to think about these fonts when you're using them. Now, let's talk about the fonts you shouldn't use and why you should use them. So what about the scripted fonts? The image fonts, or maybe some created or decorated fonts, um, Aldi and Wingdings. But I'm sure, I'm sure all of you are using Wingdings to mess with, or you're doing every all your PowerPoint presentations in Vivaldi. <laughs> so the reason we don't want to use these is because in the HTML code for these particular fonts lives the fact that screen readers cannot read. When the screener is reading along and it hits one of these fonts, it just doesn't know what to say. And oftentimes it will skip the content. As opposed to using the serif or saying the serif font, where it can roll right over top of them and read them easily to the students. Um, if you decide that you want to use some of these pretty fonts, there are ways to use them work around to, to make them pretty or to make things um, very interesting. I just have to be careful, and I would suggest working with an instructional designer 
or uh, maybe someone that is a 508 expert at your institution to get this issue with that. There are definitely ways that it can be done. So talk about color. Years in the design world as a marketing manager, I learned a lot about color. And there's four different classifications. So in GP, which I'm sure you've seen a million times if you've ever changed the color of text in a work document or PowerPoint presentation, it is for red, green, and blue. The codes are the six-digit numbers that create that get created when you're using um, for HTML processing. Sam, if you have a color printer, you know what those are. That's the cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, which are specifically that. They are used for printing purposes. Goes hand in hand with TMS. Now it's the Pantone matching system, not anything else in this instance. And you can actually have a swatch book that will allow you to choose your specific color, which generally would be like PMS 135 or 158 or 281. Those colors are very specific. So you send a document to a printer, you can say, I need this printed in PMS 281. And specifically that that is a dark blue, not quite navy, but not quite royal. Able to spot check that. These are often um, very important for marketing purposes. If you've ever tried to get Coca Cola Red, Mary Kay Pink, or Kermit the Frog Green, you would, they would know exactly what those colors are. If these colors are important, is often taking colors from a Word document and maybe transferring transferring them into an LMS where it gives you the options of putting colors in a hex code and not necessarily RGB. And when we're doing this, LMS, for the most part that we use in university systems, will give you a warning if your color contrast doesn't meet this 4.5 to 1. Now, the best ways to check them, you go to this website, which they will all be available to you at the end of the presentation today. Uh, the aim.org has a color contrast checker. You can actually put the colors in and tell you if it passes or if it fails. Now, if you know what your colors are, let's say you created a really great presentation, but you have no idea what the colors are in your presentation. You have a spot color finder. The one on the, that I like in HTML is called Mozilla. It actually is an add-in. Here is an eyedropper in the upper right-hand corner of your uh, web browser. It's a really great tool to use. I love it a lot. Now, you need to take these RGB colors and convert them to hex. I found these great inverters that will easily take these colors and give take a hex code and convert it to an RGB. So the RGB hex actually will go the other way as well. If you have that you've created in an HTML file and you want to use it in a Word document but you don't know what it is, you can look it up and use it this way. Here's important. So we created this presentation. This is a template from PowerPoint. This is a Microsoft template. Well, when we typed in that very first HTML code, or um, the first web link, it produced the color of the, the link in this bluish-green color that you see on the screen, run it by 50B9C1. That color on a white background did not meet your 4.5 to 1 color contrast ratio. Building presentations in PowerPoint, it's important to check just what those colors are if they needed to be modified. Now, it used back in the day of good old XP and Office 2010 that you could change these things very easily. Unfortunately, now it's not as easy to change the colors of the links and follow links implementation. So here are the instructions on how to change it, and you'll get this presentation at the end today so that you have these instructions. But you can never go wrong on a white background using this blue represented by four zeros and two Fs. If you're on a black background using that cyan, they will always work and they'll always meet those code requirements. Stop screen readers. If you've never had any interaction with one, what it is, is it's an assistive technology tool that actually 
Company will read the content on the screen. It reads it top to bottom, left to right. At your Highlands, we have one available to our students for free. It's called Lara Read, and there are tons of them available. There's JAWS and Dolphin and Windows Eyes. Several free ones on the internet as well. You have Box, which is actually a plug-in for Google Chrome and NVDA, which will work with any internet browser and any application. A little caution about Chrome Box. If you're on, it's possible that you can't turn it off without installing it. So uh, I would just call you if you're going to use Chrome Box, uh, make sure that, um, uh, that every time you open Google, she's going to start talking. So I just want that word of warning out there. Now, our, sec our third frequently asked question about captioning it turns into three different questions. The first one is, I have students in my class that are deaf or hard of hearing. Do I really need to caption my videos? What do you think the answer to that question is? Any thoughts? Absolutely. Just because we don't have students that are hard of hearing or have hearing impairments, we need to do it. It's the law. Research has actually shown that students without disabilities really benefit from them as well. It allows students to watch the videos with the captioning on. They can pause it and even take notes off the captioning from the videos. So it's a great tool for all students, whether they have a disability or not. So the program that I teach requires that students have basic abilities like sight and hearing. Do you still need to be captioned? What do you guys think? And here is an interesting fact that comes along with that. The only entity that is not required to comply with Section 508 are entities that are directly associated with national security. Um, but um, I can still see that maybe they really should comply uh, with because they never know who they're going to be employing. Yes, no matter the interest rate. So this is even talking about the health field, like nursing, um, medicine, those types of entities. It's still important that content be fully accessible to all those students. Yes, we, need, we do need to assume that the video can be used for multiple audience and any any time, especially in the future. Um, and that is a good practice to to be part of. So this question: My video is captioned, but I have transcripts. That's okay, right? What do we think? No. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. here. Actually, no, because according to the standard, all videos must be captioned. The you can have transcripts as a supplement, but technically, the video has to be captioned. The only time transcripts only is acceptable is if it's an audio file like a podcast. The only time in which um, not having a, a would be okay. When you think about this, if you have a video and you have provided your students with a transcript, which is just in a Word document, uh, how do students supposed to know how the right, how the audio is syncing with the transcript? Um, um, and YouTube can be funny because it does it does get the captions close, but I highly caution you against using a YouTube video that you are not the author of, be sure to watch it begin and end with the captions on to make sure that the video the captions are correct. I have seen some fun videos with captions. If you ever want to see something real funny, uh, look up old Flintstone cartoons and watch their close captioning. We would laugh a lot of those. We covered our frequently asked questions. Let's talk a little bit about the guidelines for um, Word on PowerPoint files that then translates into um, Adobe Acrobat file. All this information comes from these amazing checklists that 
that the Department of Health and Human Services has created. And when we send out these particular files, I will send out the actual checklist for each of these applications. Uh, if you just follow these guidelines, you're going to hit every point you need. Again, it's as you're building and designing these these mints and these files. If you're having trouble, uh, talk to your instructional designers, talk to your um, your web gurus at your institution, uh, talk to um, anybody maybe in your uh, learning and development center or maybe someone in your disability services center. They might have resources that can help you. To uh, make these documents um, come for all of our students. So, the, um, one of the oftentimes things that we don't realize are important is that we need to make sure that the document name doesn't have any spaces or special characters in it. Ampersand, um, an asterisk, the number sign. Scratch can't read that information. So, a student downloads this document onto their computer from the LMS and they go to search for it later. Screen scrolling over their my documents folder, they may be able to locate that because it doesn't read the file name correctly. So where this idea of having a concise file name comes into play. I have an image of a frog and the file name is two three four five six A B C D E purple dot J E G G students gonna know that that's an image of a frog, but that's what screen reader is going to read. So that's why this information is important. It into document properties. We don't think about it as being uh, a way to make documents accessible, but again, it helps with that searchability for um, anyone who's using a screen reader to search their doc their computers for documents. And as an added bonus, if you've ever lost a document on your computer and you can miss it, but you need to sort of remember um, maybe a keyword that you had put in it, you can really um, search this particular metadata on your computer as well and it'll help you find your document. Kind of an added bonus. Uh, fonts and color properties. Uh, those are the fonts that are best. For, um, like I said before, Trebuchet and Georgia, they were designed specifically for use on the net as well as to home and Santa. You want you refer from using that flickering or flashing or animated text. Now, this is an animated within this presentation. This particular type of animation because it brings it in and it's not like flashing or spinning or anything like that. It's just making it visible. That's okay. You're going to refrain from those um, um, uh, uh, animations that can be used in a, in a presentation. Also, you sure that that contrast ratio between your background and foreground is 4.5 to 1. Tools, uh, use the tools within your LMS. Those are the things that are going to make your life easy in this. In this properties. Probably one of the questions I get asked the most um, before is about uh, background images or watermarks. We want to make sure that we remove those in the final version. Uh, they are not able to have alt text added to them, so they become, if they have any any sort of bearing on the content for this particular document or file that will be conveyed. I want to make sure if you have um, charts or graphs that there is a descriptive text like action put with them as well as alt text added to them as well. It can be done in Microsoft Excel, I promise. You just right click on the chart and, and put in that alt text. If you created a flow chart or an organizational chart within a Word document, you need to make sure that all of those um, are grouped together, makes it easier to move them, but it also flattens it into one final image that you can add an alt text to. So you're having to add alternative text to each particular element within that multi-layered object. You want to be sure that um, your is and your non-text elements actually have a meaning where with their alt text. So oftentimes people ask me, well, how do I know what to put here? And I send the thing every time. What an image is, that chart, that graphic. And then it 
explaining it to someone over the phone who can't see it. I allow you to give all the information you need in alternative text to the students if they so need it. If you're in track changes or comments, especially in um, if you're teaching a humanities type class like English where you're making comments on an essay, you want to make sure that you turn them off if you're leaving the reply in more document format. If your format that you're going to send it to the student is maybe a PDF, then you can uh, save file as a PDF and it will gain that information allowing the screen reader to read it. But in document form, a screen reader will not read the uh, little bits for comments or um, be very confused with the track changes. It causes all kinds of drama. So it's best to turn those track changes off. Following these guidelines, as you're building your Word, Excel, and PowerPoint presentations, and you, you follow up to the letter and to the end, and you're like, okay, I want to load this in my class, but I want it to be a PDF. It's important to remember that you just save the file as a PDF, not file as a PDF. And the reason for that is when you file as a PDF, it actually just creates images. So there's no tagging within the document. And without any tagging, a screen reader is not able to read it. By saving the PDF, all of your spell guidelines that you put in place, all of your alt text can be read by a screen reader, and it will be fully accessible to your students. Links is a good idea that when you're creating your hyperlinks, that you avoid phrases like click here or read more. Uh, it's best to include uh, the hyper part of the text. So if I wanted someone to visit Georgia Highlands College, I wouldn't say visit Georgia Highlands College comma www.highlands.edu, I would take the words Georgia Highlands College and include that as part of my hyperlink. Now, in this presentation, I have many of those hyperlinks written out, but it's more for your benefit if you need to copy and paste the information. Your email links are accessible. That's super simple. Just hit the space bar, and nine times out of ten, it will work. And it's always a good idea to check your destinations to make, that they're, make sure they're working properly and that um, the hyperlinks are spelled correctly. Just for a reason, there is no other way to make the content that you're creating accessible. Let's say making an infographic for your class. The way to make an accessible version of it is to just create a text-only version. It would be very plain, just white background, black text, and just put all of the text that you would have included on your infographic, as well as that alternative text that would describe the images, put information in just a generic document, calling it text only or accessible version, and including that within your course is the best way to get around that. Believe it or not, Print Preview is your friend. I use it all the time to make sure that what I have created on my screen is usually what I want to be seen in its final draft when it's finally output. And probably my one of my biggest and best tools that I've used. We've reached the end of the presentation today. I was about 20 minutes for questions. I'm sure there's probably a lot. So I just put them in the chat or raise your hands. I'll be glad to answer any questions you guys have. And crickets. What was that everybody was responding uh, during the presentation to? Oh, I just see those. Oh, where I got them, I, I was sharing them out too. Oh, great. Thanks, Jeff. Well, very much, Katie, uh, for, for the uh, presentation. Oh, wait, we've got a question um, from Julie. Can you mention? the rule about using color text, is it best to only use black text? As of my answer to that question is no. Um, as someone who deals with um, accessibility frequently, the answer to that question is no. Uh, 
So um, you can use lots of colors. Um, you're just wanting to make sure that you use those contrast tools. I highly recommend using the one from WebAIM, the color contrast checker. It is your it is your friend. It allows you to lighten and darken your foreground and your background colors. So like foreground color would be your text and your background is obviously whatever the back of your image is. Um, use them. Use them. Foreign languages. Um, how more accessible. Foreign languages have been a very, very tough uh, situation for OER too. So this would be a really good question. That is, that is tricky. Um, for listening tests, um, it, it requires some creative thinking between yourself and um, an instructional designer. The things that I have done here is we have created audio versions of um, the speaking words in Spanish. And he's wanting the students to uh, convey that information in English, like the English version of whatever she's saying. So in a, um, we open the audio file, do the quiz tool with our LMS, and then in the text portion where you'd actually put the question in, we actually uh, uh, write the question in Spanish. Not only can you hear it, but you can see it and read it. And then the answers, of course, are all of the translations in English. That's how we've done a lot of them. Um, a little time consuming if you have many of them in your course. But with pictures, where, um, let's say for an apple, and you want a student to be able to tell you what that is in Spanish, we just use the English translation so that um, the student doesn't you know, you train reader and uh, get the answer to the question that way. Does that help at all? Thanks. Um, okay. Julie says, so if an online instructor uses red text for emphasis, is this okay? I usually it's, suggest that they use bold formatting for emphasis instead of a different color. Okay. It depends on if they're saying if they're saying um, see the text in red, I would not use it that way. But if you're wanting to highlight the text, let's say um, it's a situation where you're wanting to highlight the words U.S. Constitution in a set of text, and you want them to see it over, over again, yes, that's okay. okay. I want color to be the defining factor. You want to say all the, all the words highlighted in blue, tell me what those mean. You can't know if you have someone that, that potentially is colorblind who couldn't see that color. Um, Nikki, they either or me or inventory, but the question should not be captioned. So, Nikki, are you are you using um doing videos for questions and you you're using like a video where Seeing the person, videos going to take. You may just try using audio and then providing a transcript in whatever language you don't want them to. If a Spanish person speaking, provide this transcript to them in Spanish. And if you're wanting them to tell you what the English version of it is, so that way they're not using the transcript to answer the question. The transcript's just there as the assistive tool. I hope Nikki. To in Julie. Um, about uh, feedback on papers, I believe turn it in is fully accessible. I don't use it in the class that I teach, but the people that I do work with use it, and I believe that it is fully accessible for leaving comments if you use their um, the feedback option. I can't think off the top of my head what it's called, but their feedback tool within Turnitin, I believe, is fully accessible. Uh, if you have more questions for me, um, you can get my contact information, and maybe we can work together to try to help figure out another option. Um, I believe you can use Turnitin in a mobile app on a tablet. 
I don't use it on a cell phone, but I'm sure you can use it on the tablet. Depends on the nature of the application, too. Um, if you've got uh, a third-party company making them, like, for example, uh, Kindle has some accessibility features within it. Uh, but it really depends on the company and what they're doing if you're talking about mobile apps, because those are very closed off. Exactly. And it's like when Arnold says that it does actually have a mobile app. I know that it, was, I know that it worked with um, the tablet. Does anyone have any more questions? When when Jeff sends out the PowerPoint presentation, I'll make sure my contact information is in there. The best way to reach me is via email. So if you have questions, please don't hesitate to shoot me an email. If I don't know the answer, I will figure it out and get to you. Yeah, as soon as I get the file, I'll send it out to all the restaurants, and then it will be available on our training and development site of an affordable learning center. Uh, which is at affordablelearninggeorgia.org slash events slash training. Great. Well, thank you to Katie, and thank you for everybody for participating today and asking questions. And um, this archive will be up on that same training and development page along with the slides. And thank you, Katie, so much for sharing your expertise in this. You're welcome. I was happy to do it. If anything you guys ever need, just let me know. Thanks, everybody.